the India Tourism Mumbai's storytelling series conducted by the regional level guides of the Western and Central India. Over the past two months, we have been traveling across the Western and Central India, discovering some of the important tourism destinations, attractions and experiences which came to us by our great storytellers amongst the regional level guides. Today, we, we take you to India's one of most delightful tourism destination, Goa. And to tell us the story, we have a senior guide, Miss Jenny Pacho, who will take us into the various facets of Goa. Not only the attractions, not only the beaches, but the culture, festival, heritage, etc. In fact, I should confess at this time, Goa is al always on the top of bucket list of many travelers. Before I had been to Goa, it was always a dream destination and the excitement that I had when I first planned my trip to Goa was something which cannot be explained. So I hope and that today we will have a kind of going back to time for those who have already been to Goa and for those who have not been to Goa, let this be a great initiation and I once again thank all the visit, all the participants who have joined today and wish you all a great uh, journey of Goa. Thank you. Jenny ma'am, you can start. Can you hear me? Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Jenny Pacheco. I am a senior guide. I've been your guide for the last 30 years in this exciting profession of tourism. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about Goa. Of course, there's so much already on the internet about Goa. But then, you know, the local people have something special to tell you as well. But let's start with the history of Goa. Uh, you know, from ancient times, countless of years ago, they say that Lord Balthiram uh, traveled to this area and he fired an arrow into the Arabian Sea and all these rastras, these masses of land came up and one such mass of land was Goa uh, and from that time the Hindu people found this area to be very holy. In fact it was known as Goman and you know Go means cow and cow is holy for the Hindus and uh, over the years we don't have much recorded history but more recently, we had the Portuguese people. The Portuguese uh, arrived in Goa in, 19, in 1510, and they were here till 1961, 451 years. Um, so Goa had, before that, had seen the arrival of the Greeks, the Arabs, for them, this region on the west coast of India. Uh, with all the rivers, formed an excellent harbor, and uh, it was a trading center. Uh, Goa became famous everywhere, people from the east, from the west, and so when the Portuguese were looking to find a place where they could set up a trading center, they found Goa to be the most habitable, the most uh, beautiful, and hence, Old Goa has come up in that area. Old Goa is the city of Goa, actually, when the Portuguese came here and started to build their uh, infrastructure for governing all the territories that were conquered, right from Europe to the Far East to Japan. And of course, the Portuguese had come for not just the spices, but also for the chance to evangelize, to Christianize. Hence, today, Old Goa is a ruin, of course, but 
it became a world heritage site because it symbolizes it symbolizes the the beginning of Christianity in the East. Okay, so for 451 years, Goa, the city of Goa, grew very big. They say at that, that time in the 16th, 17th century, there were more than 250,000 people living in that city from all over the world trading. And uh, after some time, it, the other Europeans found the route to India, and soon the Portuguese began to lose their importance, their territories, their business, their trade. But they clung on to Goa till 1961. After that, Goa experienced what we call the liberation of Goa by the Indian government. Since 1961 to present day, Goa has, you know, changed such a lot. For a long time, Goa was uh, a quiet place. But then at the end of the 1960s, Goa was very popular with the hippies. And this is another story to tell, uh, the hippie story. For many, many years, we had the hippies living in Goa. And with them came tourism. A lot of people traveled here to find what it was the hippies were uh, happy with in Goa. And it was the quiet, the calm, the beaches, the uh, people. Of course, the people were the most important. And with the a start of the hippies arriving here, there was the chance for the local people to give them some accommodation, food, and so started small little restaurants, hotels in the, on the beaches of Kalangut. That was the most famous beach for a long time. And once the Taj built their hotel, then that's the Fort Aguada. Then we had a lot of tourists coming from all over the world. So, besides the, the hippies staying here, we have something which came about because of the hippies, the flea market, the hippie market on Wednesdays in Goa, on the beach of Anjuna. We also have another market which has become very popular called the uh, Saturday night market. It's very popular. Everyone goes there to spend the Saturday evening. And you have music, all kinds of fusion music, food, lots of stalls selling things. Very nice, relaxed atmosphere. And the most, of course, the most important thing that happened in Goa was the people began to have a livelihood, about 40% of local people, it seems, have a chance to earn some money from the tourist trade. Um, then I wanted to tell you about Old Goa and Panjim, the new, new city. After some time, Old Goa lost its importance and the Portuguese shifted their capital to Panjim or Panaji or like local people call it Onji. So, can we see some pictures? The pictures of old Goa. I can't see. Anyway, I had some slides with the uh, pictures of old Goa. I hope everyone can see them, but I can't. Um, and in Panjim, the new capital since 1843, the capital of Goa, it's a very pretty, cute, small little town. You can walk from one end to the other. I mean, if you think of Bombay, 
the population, official population of Kanjim is just about 60,000. But it's very charming, very nice. There's an area called Fontaine, which is where a lot of people who stay there speak Portuguese. It's got a very Portuguese air. The houses are very cute. The architecture is unique to Goa. It's called indoor, indoor Portuguese architecture. Yeah. And one of the features, there's many features. If you walk in that area, if you look up on the roof, there's usually a rooster on the top of the roof. Sometimes it's a little soldier, you know, saluting. Sometimes it's a, a just a pot overturned. It means something to some people, I guess. Also, you'll see the colors that, you know, were used to paint these houses. At one time, it was very strict. Just four colors were allowed, any one of those four colors. And all the doors and windows had to have white trim. This was to give a, a kind of proportion to the whole area to make it look nice. And there's still this air about it. That's spontaneous, a part of Panjim City. So, other things that you can do, like there's something for everyone in Goa. There's uh, good food, there's fish, which is not easily found everywhere. There's um, lots of meat dishes because Goans were influenced by the Portuguese. And the most famous dish, lots of people know about it, is Vindalu, or Vindalu, Vindalu, like the Portuguese might say. It's a pork dish usually, marinated with spices, vinegar. Vinegar is something that's not common in India at all. Vinegar was made by the Portuguese when they came here from the toddy. They taught us rather how to make it. So uh, this is one of the things that people tend to buy to take home, especially Goan people who live out of Goa and when they come for their holidays because you don't get it anywhere. Coconut vinegar. And I've read that it's one of the best vinegars in the world. I've read this. Okay. So... The most famous dish of Goa is, of course, the prawn curry with rice. And you can taste this if you go for a spice plantation tour that's in the interior of Goa. Okay. So the spice plantation is about 30 kilometers from Panjim. Uh, very nice, the interior, the cool, shady, lots of trees, lots of plants. and the best part is you get a guide on the plantation to take you around. You get to taste Goan food, typical Goan food. And, you know, there's a Hindu population and a Christian population, also a Muslim population, but the Hindu population is about 66% and the Catholic population about 28%. So, we do have a slight difference in the food that you can try in Goa, but I would recommend going to a place where you can get a Goan Thali. So you get to taste the rice, the curry, the vegetables, and some fried fish. Very nice. So other things that I would have liked to tell you about, you can visit, of course, are the forts of Goa. F-O-R-T-S, Fort. There's the famous Aguada Fort, which is at the end of the Kalangut Road. You can, uh, all the taxi drivers know it. It's also an ASI heritage uh, area. Um, the Aguada Fort is built on two levels. And there's a prison there. There is not for you or anyone. It was in the Portuguese days, a prison. There's an old chapel. And 
there is a lighthouse. The lighthouse was uh, supposed to be have been the first lighthouse in Asia. Okay. But that's the old one that has been closed and there's a new lighthouse next to it. There's a very beautifully built fortress inside. There was a huge uh, area where they could store water. There were four springs that fed this big tank. And so Aguada. Agua means water. And Aguada was the place where ships used to be passing by, stop in Goa, take water and carry on, you know, east or west. So Goa happened to be somewhere in the between Europe and Japan. So that's the Fort Aguada. Then there's another very equally beautiful fort called Rage Magus, the Three Kings, Three Kings Fort. You can visit that one as well. In fact, there were more than 20 forts built by the Portuguese all along the coast to guard from invaders. And you know, the, the English, the French, and the Dutch were also making uh, forays into this area. The next thing I would like to talk about is music. You know, Goa is famous for its music. We have our own kind of music. I can't tell you whether it's Portuguese or Indian music. It's just its own kind of music. And uh, some of the most famous musicians of Goa, Lata Mangeshkar, she happens to come from a place called Mangeshi, her ancestors. So maybe we sent the music with her. But Goa, the, everyone can play some musical instruments, sing well. And in the Bollywood uh, studios recording music, you'll find a great amount of Goan musicians. The Goan musicians, uh, why did they, you know, why were they able to make it so big in Bollywood? Is because they could read music. They learned Western music from the missionaries. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the old Goa, that place, that little old city, which is now in ruins, which you most probably will see and have seen, uh, there were a lot of churches and a lot of missionaries came from Europe. And in the village schools, they would on Sundays teach the young children Latin or they would teach them music, uh, Western music. So because of this, the Goan musicians get, had a chance to make it big in Bollywood. So if you'd like to learn, listen to some music in Goa, you could... Uh, in fact, Bollywood music would hear many musicians. There's another kind of music that I would like you to possibly see, uh, to, to possibly listen, <laughs> is the Goa trance music. If that's right, trance music, and it puts you in a trance. It's very, very nice music. It came about with the hippie influence. So there's an Indian and a fusion kind of music. But if you go to the hippie market on, on the Wednesday, you'll be able to hear a lot of trance music. So music is the food of life and music really keeps us all happy. Um, on your way from Old Goa coming to Panjim, you will be driving along the river Mandovi. You know, we have so many rivers in, in Goa, nine big rivers that uh, flow from the Western Ghats into the Arabian Sea. So every little while you come across 
rivers and streams. We have water everywhere. Along the river banks are mangroves. Mangroves are the special tree that grows between grows between the land and the water, like an in between. And the mangroves are so important for Goa because a lot of us enjoy the fish from the mangroves. So most of, most people make their prawn curry with the mangrove prawn. We also have fishing it by the sea, but most people like their fish from the rivers in Goa. The sea fish, a lot of it is exported and some of it goes to the hotels. So when in Goa, you must eat some fish, you must try some fish. Prawn, then there's uh, kingfish, there's mackerel, sardines, okay. The mangroves also help in stabilizing the land and the river. They absorb all that, you know, the monsoons, very heavy rain coming. Uh, we have about uh, 110 inches of rain every year from June to September. This year we had almost a half more, about 160 inches of rain. And this is why you see Goa is so green. Everywhere, if you come during the rains, all the paddy fields are green with rice, growing rice. Rice is the main crop in Goa. And uh, by September, it's the end of the monsoon. Yeah, so it's the end of the monsoons and people are busy harvesting the rice crop. All these things are very nice to see in the fields, everybody working hard, that the rice is cut, dried, beaten, and you'll see it drying on the roadsides. Uh, then people, once they have their rice organized, everything else, the whole year is going to go well because, you know, you have rice, you can make so many things with it. So in Goa, rice has been the staple and we hardly ever knew what was wheat before. But when the Portuguese came, they They brought the art of baking of pound with them. So, you know, in, in Bombay, many Goan people were called pound wallas. It's because when they were in Goa, they learned how to bake bread. And uh, the baker in Goa is a very popular person. Every day, early morning, later in the evening, he passes by your house honking, honk, honk, and then people rush out to buy their evening bread or morning bread. And this bread, we didn't have yeast in Goa, but we learned how to make bread with the toddy from the coconut tree. So the toddy can get fermented, and then uh, you make about six, seven different types of bread. The pao is the most famous. You will, people in Bombay will know pao. And what would you do without that pao if you have quantity vada pao? <laughs> so vada pao, the pao is gone. That's our connection to Bombay or perhaps all over India. Okay. So the pao is a square, soft bread. It's eaten in the dinner, usually dinner time. Then we have the undo, we have a katra, katra pao, we have a poi, poi is my favorite. Then there's the kankon, it's like a bangle. And so, when people, a lot of people eat pao, hardly ever. Chapati. Chapati is recently. Before that, it was always rice, something called bakri. So 
puppy is there now and it's more of sound. And uh, a lot of people also used to eat for breakfast a uh, rice pudding, not a rice pudding, a rice uh, kind of a soup. Rice is boiled and at about 10, 30, 11 in the morning, the whole family would eat this rice, which is like the soup. And mainly this was like a snack, midday snack. Today, the, a lot of people eat bhaji pao in the so if you go to Panjim or any of the local restaurants, you can have a bhaji pao at about 10, 30, 11. Later on in the evening, if you're hungry before dinner, you can have bhaji pao, corn bhaji. It's usually made of uh, peas, a dal kind of uh, preparation, sometimes with some vegetables. Then uh, I want to tell you a little bit about Goan architecture. Because sometimes people do say uh, Portuguese houses, but no, these are Goan houses. A few in, uh, influences from Portuguese, but also from many other countries. When you walk in that area called Fontaines, you will notice the windows, the windows, the old style of window. They have shells instead of glass. It's said that the glass used to be imported. So we didn't have much of glass. It was expensive. So people learned to make these shutters for the windows out of shell. So the shell that you ate the shell, maybe you ate the shellfish, and the shell you dried it, and then it was cut in squares and slatted into the window. So you can see this also in Fontaine's, that area. Then I wanted to tell you also in the various villages in Goa, there are some beautiful mansions. Uh, there is the Menezes Braganza House, which is a very famous uh, place to visit for tourists. It is open to tourists. You have to pay a little money before entering to see the place. And there you can see what heights the Goan house went to in architecturally speaking, furniture, uh, beautiful objects, wooden, uh, teak, rosewood, China, a lot of things came from China. Everywhere in Goa, you will see in people's houses, Chinese porcelain, vases there and there's another house uh, called the Figueredo mansion that's also really worth visiting you will have a good idea of what went on in Goa you have a guide there who will tell you lots about Goa so these houses were built for generations so they were very very big these two houses that I mentioned the Menezes Piganza house and the Figueredo mansion. They had their own ballrooms, you know, they, when they had parties, they had dances, and uh, these ball, ballrooms had beautiful chandeliers. Uh, you will see some in the churches in Old Goa, chandeliers. These were imported from Belgium, Belgian glass, and very, very beautiful and well maintained in these houses. They were decoration for the ballroom. The houses were also, usually the big houses had their own chapel. And a lot of these houses were recently converted Hindu people to Christianity. So they had their own chapel because they were rich and well-to-do and that's another thing to see so you can in both these houses you can see the chapel very beautiful carved 
then there are paintings on the walls. This is something you can see also in old Goa, like a graffiti on the walls. This was the kind of decoration there were in these houses. And you will see a lot of it in the Menezes Braganza house, the Figueredo mansion, and in the, some of the churches, a little few portions of it remain and are preserved. Because what happened was they had a plague in the city of Goa, and a lot of the buildings, a lot of the people died, and a lot of the buildings were abandoned, a lot of the churches. So there was no money really to repair these buildings, and hence at, when they had to paint the buildings, they just whitewashed them, and a lot of the paintings got uh, hidden behind the whitewash. But you can see it in these big houses if you go. Inesis Pedanza, Figurator Mansion. Uh, some of the people are more adventurous today, the young people. And of course, uh, everyone wants to go to the beach. A lot of people like to try the sports there, water sports. And that's good. Um, I say the least and I leave it to the last about, about uh, alcohol in Goa. Okay, we make our famous Feni alcohol in Goa. And um, this is made from the cashew, the cashew uh, fruit, not from the nut. The cashew nut is on its it's another industry on its own. The cashew nut is a very big industry in Goa. It is processed here. There are lots of little factories that employ local women. They cut the cashew nut open. They steam it first. They steam the nuts. And then they take out the kernel, which is then roasted for about a few hours. Don't know exactly what. Four hours, six hours, maybe just to make them nice and crisp. Then you can get buy cashew nuts. The most famous cashew nuts in Goa are the Zantier, make the brand cashew nut. And this is locally produced. But the fruit is not wasted. The cashew fruit is full of juice. And this juice is another small industry in Goa. These are squeezed, the juice is fermented and then distilled. And in the month of uh, March, April, May, you can smell feni everywhere. It's a very nice time. It reminds you of summer and it's holiday time for children. And the grown ups drink a little cashew feni or some ura, make it into a cocktail and carefully control consumption of alcohol. Of course, you have a lot of bars everywhere. And of course, Indian tourists love to visit those bars. Um, cashew feni is also exported, but not that much because it's a taste that is uh, takes a little time to get used to and it's very strong. So you have to be careful for how much you drink. The other feni is a coconut feni. This is also processed from the toddy. And that's another kind of feni, also very strong. Sometimes used in food preparations, but mostly drunk in the evening. The local people are used to having a little alcohol. And it makes life happy, and you can go on. <laughs> so, I have uh, another 10 minutes to talk about something or the other. I think most people are interested in the nightlife in Goa. I think 
you all know that in Goa, this only place in India, we have casinos. Uh, casinos are on the river Mandovi. And there are these five or six boats, very attractive in the night if you pass by. They're all lit up and it's uh, very attractive for a lot of people because there's some entertainment, there's music, there's food, but of course is gambling. So a little caution, but some people like it, some people want to go on these boats. So from the shore, they are taken to these casinos and you can spend the whole evening into late night. And you are, it's very safe. There's a lot of security around. Besides the casinos, there are the other boats, the pleasure boats, the cruises, we call them the cruises. And that's very popular with the tourists. You can see that uh, you have to buy a ticket, go on board, and for about an hour, you are taken around right up to the Mandovi, mouth of the Mandovi River. And there's onboard entertainment. There are local people who are singing, playing music for you. Uh, they invite you to dance. And lots of young people like to shake a leg there. Uh, very entertaining. And there are local dances local people doing a local dance and uh, that's uh, there's a mando mando is a famous dance of goa famous for us okay, for goa uh, so we have local people who showcase these dances the mando and the kurudin that's a portuguese dance and then there's also a third dance of the uh, rural people okay. so sometimes you also have a chance to hear local music koan music on these boat trips um besides this besides this entertainment on the river now there is recently a new phenomenon you have these speed boats can be expensive but people when you're on holiday, you would like to spend your money. It seems to be a very nice thing. You go on a speed boat on the Mandovi River. It's very popular with local people, with the uh, Indian people who come to Goa for marriage. It's a marriage. Goa is a marriage destination. Uh, a lot of young couples come here, and then on that speed boat they do a wedding uh, shoot phot photographs and a lot of the hotels in Goa have wedding planners and you can have your wedding at a, one of these beachside resorts very nice on the sand good music food and swaying palms nice airy sea breezes so if you're getting married, keep Goa in mind. <laughs> Other entertainment in Goa, there are a lot of nightclubs uh, along the beach belt. And people like to go spend the night there. The famous Tito's, Baga Beach, the restaurants everywhere, very good food. I'm worried I will overshoot my time. So I have five minutes more. Just thinking what I could tell you. Okay, there I thought I would tell you some interesting stories. Uh, I'd like to tell you about, you know, this during the Second World War. This is a story of mine that I don't say it is touristic, but it's interesting. Uh, during the Second World War, 
uh, Goa was neutral, Portugal was neutral. So uh, in the rest of India, we had the British and Goa was Portuguese. So in the harbor, there were some German ships and the British got to know that there was someone in Goa who was sending messages to the Germans about the passing British ships. So they realized that they had to deal with this person. And so some British commandos came over the border and they zoomed into these people, this person who was sending all the messages, the information about the uh, ships, the British ships that were passing by. And then these commandos went to the harbor. First of all, I think they did away with the guy who was sending the messages, spirited him away. And there were a couple of ships they, in the harbor. They put uh, something to detonate and sink those ships. And so, the aftermath of this was that a lot of German soldiers got left behind in Goa and were hiding and didn't know what to do and what was happening. Now, a few of these German soldiers or Navy sailors landed up in prison, in Fota Guada prison. And uh, eventually, these Germans kind of integrated with local people. Some of them married local women. And we have some Owens who are a mix of German from those German soldiers and local ladies. And some of our, we have a couple of guides in Goa who do guiding with us. And they are, uh, their surnames are strange. Schmidt. We had a blue eyed watch repairer in Panjim. A German, and this is was this was a consequence of that World War Two, and uh, a movie was made from this uh, whole incident called The Sea Wolves. If you want, you can see it on the internet. The Sea Wolves. Okay. I, <laughs> I still have two minutes, and I have one more story to tell you. Uh, in England in the 1970s, in the 1970s, there was a murder committed by a Lord Lucan. Okay, and it is said that he meant to murder his wife, but he murdered the nanny. And then after this happened, he disappeared completely. Uh, nobody it became, and up to now, there are people who want to know what happened and where he hid himself. Now, one of the places that he may have hidden himself, and I strongly believe that he did hide himself in Goa. And I'll tell you why. There were, there were the hippies who used to come by road, and it's very possible that he was among those hippies who came to Goa by road. In the 1970s, there was uh, 70s or 80s, there was a man called Jungle Berry who used to live in the jungle. He had very long beard and bushy hair, and you could uh, hardly see his face. But it is said that that was Lord Lucan. It's not proved, and Jungle Berry doesn't live, he's dead. But I myself, one day when I was passing by, uh, a beach restaurant and I had stopped at the side and I happened to look to one side and in the bushes was a small board outside a restaurant. The board said Lucan's Nest. Now Lucan is not a very popular name and I was surprised because I had read about this Lord Lucan. So it's up to you what you think. What do you think? Is was Lord Lupin in Goa. <laughs> so with that, I end my... Okay. Are there any questions? 
Jenny? Yes. Uh, well, this is Bhavna from India Tourism Mumbai. Thank you so much for all your beautiful information that you provided on Goa. But uh, we have one or two questions here. Someone is asking about port wine. Uh, could you just uh, give a suitable reply to it? What is port wine and how was it famous? How, it how has it become famous? Okay. Uh, port wine, it was actually because of the Portuguese that we had in Goa, port wine. Uh, mm -hmm. Because, of course, wine is not something Indian. But port wine is made from maybe raisins or grapes. But it's a very sweet and strong wine that uh, uh, people, I know a lot of tourists buy port wine. But it's not really that original because you don't get the proper ingredients here but it's it's good it's nice it's a sweet wine and it's meant for normally after dinner a ladies drink maybe that's port wine port wine but uh, yes you can buy casual liquor uh, if you go to the wine shops, of course, there's all kinds of alcohol. And of course, at a very good price compared to all Bombay and Bangalore, etc. So, it was becoming a big, uh, well-known alcohol destination. You can buy good gin, very good whiskey. Uh, some of the world's best whiskey, it seems, is this Amrut whiskey and... Uh, Paul John whiskey and about 2000 rupees less in price than in Bombay. Port wine is very affordable. You can get a cashew wine, a cashew uh, penny, and coconut penny as well. Okay, uh, Jenny, someone is asking about uh, cashew wine also, which to, you have answered to. But uh, are there any more special Goan desserts? Yes. Uh, about get a food? dessert, yeah, get two or three, two desserts, which can be, you know, bought by tourists and taken. One is mm -hmm. Bibinka, B-I-B-I-N-C-A, Bibinka. Uh, it's made of uh, coconut milk, eggs, egg yolk, sugar, and uh, flour. And it's cooked like pancakes, you know, one layer on top of the other. It's called Bidinka. And then there's another one, which is called Dodol. D-O-D-O-L. Funny names, but not funny for us. <laughs> so Dodol is uh, also made with jaggery, coconut. Um, rice flour, I think it is rice flour, and cooked, and it's like a halwa almost. Very, very Christmassy. It's all for celebrations. These sweets are made especially for celebrations, mm -hmm. for weddings and uh, old goa feasts. You know, in I forgot to tell you all that on the 3rd of December, is goa's most uh, important event that's the Feast of St. Francis Xavier and everybody goes there that is, it takes place in Old Goa and every 10 years is another very important event it's called the Exposition of St. Francis Xavier's Relics so every 10 years means we get a lot of tourists to come to see the remains, the relics of St. Francis Xavier the next time will be in 2024. So, okay. Uh, Jenny, questions are yeah, questions are coming. Uh, someone is asking. Mention some restaurants serving Goan Saraswat cuisine. Uh, 
in Panjim, there is uh, one restaurant. Well, one, of course, there would be. There is a Saraswat food festival at a certain time in the year. And then a lot of restaurants cook this special mm -hmm. Saraswat dishes. Yes. Um, thank you. Somewhere near the market, there's a hotel, Delmon. Delmon. D E L M O N. And there they have a whole a uh, few days of celebrating the Saraswat cuisine. Okay, but it's at a special time of the year. But otherwise, no. Uh, some famous restaurants for Goan food, okay, there are plenty. There's Mom's Kitchen, there's Ritz Classic, Navkara. Um, and if you don't mind those small hole in the wall joints, that's where you get the best curries. You know, the Goan uh, Thali is all about the curry. If the curry has been well made, the dish goes down well. And every housewife makes a different curry. Every husband claims their wife makes the best curry. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Jenny, for that. Well, yeah. Tombi is asking about if you could tell a little bit more on um, on Dona Paula. So you know, uh, Dona Paula is this portion of land that juts out into the Arabian Sea. On one side is the Mandovi River, one side is the uh, Zuari River, and this piece of land. It's called Donna Paula after the daughter of one of the viceroys of who was living who was uh, living in Donna Paula. Okay. So the governor's palace is there. And Donna Paula, uh, you know, it's I know that there are some stories told about her, like she was the daughter of a big person and she fell in love with the fisherman and then she just killed herself. She threw herself over those rocks there at Donna Paula because she could not be with her, the person she loved, the man she loved. But uh, there's no proof of this. However, mm -hmm. we all love Jenny, her. I think we don't have any questions further. Okay. Okay. So, thank you, Parul. Hello. Thank you for Bhavna. Jenny, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Continue. Continue. Ah, so I just said about Donna Paula. We don't have proof of this event happening. Mm -hmm. But it's a nice story and it makes everyone feel uh, nostalgic. <laughs> okay. Um, whether it happened or not, we don't know. Yeah, I can understand. But I'm sure there are plenty of love stories everywhere in yes. Goa. Yeah. Mm, well, thank you, Jenny. Thank you so much. You've taken us back in time about. Uh, for Goa and winning about Goa. Thank you Hello. once again from India Tourism. Thank you everyone, thank you. Thank I'm you. sorry if I did the photographs, I don't know whether they came on screen because I couldn't see any. Mm -hmm. Well, there were some problems with the photographs too because uh, that's what Parul told me. But nevertheless, oh. you, you spoke about it. Oh, okay. yeah. 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 <laughs> thank you so much. Again. <laughs> okay. Bye yeah. there. Thank Bye, you, everyone. Thanks for joining in the webinar. Thank you. Thank you.